Good morning to everyone here. It's great to have you all along. And a special welcome to those that are um, coming in online. Our first song this morning is number 34. Number 34. Amen. Please be seated. We will have up the back a uh, missions update from the Marnie Ma family, uh, Pastor Michael Marnie in Fiji, and there's a lot happening there. We've also got an urgent prayer request from the uh, Gary and Faith McKay in Papua New Guinea. Uh, they ask us to pray for a little cold girl, three years old, by the name of Mwengi. And she was by the river and a, um, a camping by the river when a tree broke over them and struck the child in the head. She's been unconscious for a period of time. She's regained consciousness just before they actually got her to the McKay's house, but she's still in a very serious condition. They're new Christians as such, 
and of course there's a lot of people watching what's going to happen to her. Let's just have a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we would bring the Mwengi. We would pray for her recovery this morning. And we do pray for the Mackays, that you'd give them wisdom at this time. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would be exalted. Lord, we likewise think of the Mani family and um, Lord, the busyness that they have in Fiji. Watch over them. Bless that ministry, we pray. Lord, we especially thank you for this day that we can share together both this morning and this evening. We thank you and praise you. Amen. And had a few notices. And my notices are, excuse me. Super organised, that's me. Uh, we've got a youth camp coming up, of course, in January. If you want to assist with any children there financially, please let us know. Uh, Brother Bryce is preaching this morning, and, but there will be people here most of the day, especially from 2.30 onwards, we'll be setting up out here on our northern lawns. We've put a lot of water out there. It should be soft and not dusty underfoot. And um, it's going to be a great afternoon, evening. Uh, there'll be, so from 2.30 there'll be people here. Um, they'll be setting up chairs. There's some shade being set up. All sorts of activities. I know some of the men have got cricket going. There's horseshoe tossing. There'll be all sorts of things out there uh, available. From 5 o'clock this evening there's a free sausage sizzle. Uh, there'll be drinks there. There's games, as I mentioned. And then 6 o'clock we have our traditional carol service. I say traditional because isn't it great to be able to sing a, the Christmas carols the way they were meant to be sung and not try and make them into, morph them into something else. And I know it's always been a favourite. People, even non-believers, like to hear the real Christmas carols. Saturday the 16th, the young adults have a Hawaiian shirt party. Um, that's at 12 o'clock on Saturday the 16th for a barbecue in Berrigan. Uh, bring a present swap under $20 and um, see me if you'd like transport up there. We've arranged a small bus at great expense. <laughs> Sunday the 24th is David Young will be with us. He'll be our speaker. Christmas Day service is 9.30 and that'll be a shorter service. And then, of course, we have our junior camp, a senior camp, 8th to the 12th of January. Then there'll be a wedding of Lawson, Jekyll and Sarah Park on the 13th of December. And then January the 15th to the 19th, there's the junior camp. Be praying for both those camps. We have a number of people here cooking at both camps and involved. And we're thanking the Lord just for his graciousness and also the opportunity to be involved with that. Our next song this morning is number 99. Isn't it good to come out this morning into the house of the Lord? Sorry there about that. <laughs>
Sing Singer, please be seated. I'll ask the men if, to come forward, thanks, to collect the offering. And the offering is always a wonderful time to give back something to the Lord. Ask if Kevin could give thanks for the offering. Dear Lord, this morning we just uh, come before you. We thank you for mm. to be able to come out today. Thank you for the offering, the monies that have been given. This morning we just thank you for your provisions. We ask uh, for your wisdom given to us and use this for us today. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, men. Our Bible reading this morning is from Ephesians chapter 2. I'll ask if Andrew could come and read that for us. Thanks. I think I've shrunk it here, brother. Well, I thought you that way too. <laughs> <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, reading from uh, yeah. verse 4 onwards. But God, who is rich in mercy and his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and has raised up us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Verse and verse 9, thank you. Uh, not of works, lest any man should boast. May the Lord bless her reading of his word in our hearts. Amen. I think I'll ask if Roger could come forward, thanks, and lead us in the next song and the Lord's table. For those online, we've still got the stage from our Sunday school presentation here. <laughs> of course, we're all hiding behind the pulpit well and truly. Thank you. And I'll tell you, I'm extra short too, so you can hardly see over, but anyway. Well, that was terrible, isn't it? You nearly need a little something to stand on. I'll tell you, actually. I think you'll need it too, Bryce, because you're a little bit like me. So, oh no, it's, it's very disconcerting being that low. Okay, if you'd like to turn your hymn books to um, hymn number 218, we'll remain seated and we'll just sing the first verse of 218.
So as we prepare our hearts for the time around the Lord's table, we invite all those who are walking in fellowship with him to participate. It's been an interesting week this week. I've had that song on my heart this week, Burdens are Lifted at Calvary, and I sent Esther a message asking you to play that. Thanks for that, Esther. Mm -hmm. And um, I was thinking about the burden of sin, and then I started to prepare a communion talk today, and I started in Psalm 30, and then I went somewhere else, and I really struggled this week with the communion talk, and Susan and I were looking at a testimony the other day, and um, I thought it's a really good testimony, so I thought instead of a a Bible reading so, per se, I, I thought we'd sh I'd share the, um, the testimony with you and it's a little bit about the lifting the burden. So I'll, I'll just share this with you now. So Charles Weigel, I don't know if anyone's heard of Charles Weigel, yeah. pastor's heard of him. He was an itinerant evangelist and songwriter. One day he returned home after preaching at an evangelistic meeting and I found a note from his wife. It simply said, I am leaving Charlie. I don't want to live the life you are living. I want to go the other way, to the bright lights. And I thought about that and I thought, you know, how often do we see people come into the church and they turn their back on the Lord and walk away? And uh, so this is, this, this uh, Charles has faced with that at this point in time. And to add insult to his injury, she had taken their only daughter with her. And I thought, I wouldn't like my children to be taken from me. So his wife's left him and he's take, she's taken the daughter with him. That night, Charlie Weagle wandered the streets alone, finally winding up the end of a pier where he contemplated ending it all. However, despite all that had happened to him, he vowed to live his life for Jesus. And I think at times when we think about the communion table and we think about our lives in general, at some point we've got to make a decision to live our lives for Jesus regardless of what's going on around us. So approximately eight months later, he met his estranged wife in Los Angeles. She mocked him by telling him of all the sins that she had committed. Sadly, a couple of years later, she lay on her deathbed. Her daughter was by her side. Evidently, she was remembering the better life she had lived with Weagle. She turned to her daughter and said, if you know where your father is, please ask him to pray for me and see if God can forgive a sinner such as I. About five years later, Charles Weigel sat down at the piano thinking about all God had brought him through. The music and words began to flow and he penned the following lyrics. Verse 1 says, I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus since I found in him a friend so strong and true. I would tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. And the chorus says, No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There is no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin of darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. And verse 2 goes on to say, All my life was full of sin when Jesus found me. All my heart was full of misery and woe. Jesus placed his strong and loving arms about me and led me in the way I ought to go. And verse 3, every day he comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand his words of love, but I'll never know just why he came to save me. Till some day I see his blessed face above. So God brought Charles Weigel through his dark moment and transformed it into a beautiful encouragement for, for a fellow discouraged followers of Jesus. And I think at times we can all be discouraged when we're following the Lord, especially when we see what's going on around the world around us. He can do the same for us as we go through our dark moments. Jesus died on the cross for all. No one is beyond redemption. Weigel's wife asked the question of her daughter if God could forgive a sinner like her. And I believe God can forgive any sinner. His promise lies in the death, the burial and the resurrection. And that's what we celebrate around the the, the Lord's table. Just two Bible verses. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And my favourite verse in the Bible is 1 John 1.9, the one I hold the hope to. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we'll take some time now just in silent prayer. So, so, so put it towards the Lord and, and then I'll ask David to give thanks for the bread.
And Lord God, we do thank you for this time that we can come and we can remember your sacrifice for us in our sinful state. We thank you for the sacrifice of your body and for the remembrance that we have now as we partake of the bread. We pray your blessing upon it. In Jesus' name, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you had our Lord Jesus institute this supper. We thank you for the cup representing your life-giving blood. We thank you. We praise you. May we take it reverently and thoughtfully. Amen.
Lord, we are just so thankful, Lord, that uh, our burdens were indeed lifted, Calvary, Lord. Our burden of sin, our burden of uh, the struggles of our life, Lord. We just ask, Lord, that you help us to remember that this week, as we make face times, and Lord, that uh, the burden is yours, not ours. For these things, we just ask in your precious name. Okay, if you'd like to open your hymn books, please. Amen. Please be seated. Bryce, I thought, I thought you'd done a runner, Bryce. <laughs> so it was down to me. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. And it's good to be able to present God's word to you this morning, Pastor. Walked past me just a minute ago and asked me if I'd like a second step to make it a little bit higher. So, <laughs> wider, brother. Wider, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's turn back, if you would, to Ephesians chapter two this morning. Now, uh, thank you to Andrew for reading that uh, for us. And our message this morning is entitled "God's Great Gift Given to You." So, God's great gift given to you, and from the book of Ephesians chapter two, and we'll be touching on quite a few verses this morning. But just uh, as an intro to Ephesians chapter 2, and uh, we'll uh, touch back on that in a moment. Throughout the scriptures, uh, there are numerous ways that God has chosen to teach us and remind us of the greatness of the work of salvation. You reckon that'll be better, eh? Uh, I think he knows I walk around sometimes, and I might fall off, maybe, I don't know. (laughs) But there are different ways that God teaches us about the nature of salvation or, or he explains it in different ways to help, help us understand more fully what Christ has done for us. Sometimes it's in a particular picture or an image or a, or a practice like the Lord's table and obviously a very visual practice for us in the bread and, and in the cup. Sometimes it's in things like the Passover, you think in the Old Testament and and the practices that they went went through culminating in the offering of the lamb, uh, foreshadowing the work of Christ. It might be in the form of a poem or a song as we read in the book of Psalms and and the poetical books. Or it could be in a very simple picture like a door or, or considering something like light. In the book of Ephesians chapter 2, we are given... Uh, a picture of salvation or a description of salvation as a gift. A gift given from God to humanity apart from any works that we could do ourselves. Most of us are fairly familiar with, uh, with, uh, or well acquainted with receiving, uh, the giving and receiving of gifts. From the time we are born, uh, usually a gift is put by our bed 
uh, Nanti and our uncle will come visit us in hospital and they leave a teddy which stays with the family, maybe for some, for some families for life. Uh, many of our childhood memories perhaps would be uh, of receiving particular gifts, maybe it's a Christmas or a birthday, and, and you remember waking up and you can't wait to get to that present and, and just pull the wrapping off and see what it is. As we approach this Christmas time, uh, no doubt most of us will be making some inroads, hopefully into buying gifts for loved ones uh, at Christmas in just a few weeks. And a gift can say so much, can't it? It can, tell, it can express perhaps sometimes the, the care of someone to another that maybe sometimes the words fail. Proverbs 17 verse 8 tells us, A gift is a precious stone in the eyes of him that has it, whithersoever it turneth, it prospereth. A well-chosen gift given to a person in love and received it can be held on to for years. It can be precious in the eyes of the person who has it, particularly if it's valued the way hopefully it's intended. You know, buying a gift, however, can be challenging. And uh, I always find that buying some of those Christmas gifts or having to delegate Kelly and the kids to do that. <laughs> You know, it, it can be challenging. You're, you've got some people that are just particularly hard to buy for, and they just see they seem to have so much, and you, or you're just not quite sure what to get them. Uh, you know, in the last few years, maybe it's more the cost, and you're trying to find the most appropriate gift with what seems like the most limited budget. And you go in the store, and, and what was a reasonable price two years ago for the present now buys you just the wrapping in the cart. Maybe you're part of the ever-growing number of people who buy online, and I believe the Black Friday sale this year uh, was, a, was a big success for a lot of retailers, a lot of people buying online. And you're there and you're sitting on the computer or your device and you're scrolling through this endless amount of things trying to, to think, what would this person want? You're trying to look through the eyes of the child or, or the adult or whoever you're buying for, thinking, what, what do they need? What are their interests? What are the things? What will they truly value and, and, and how can I get that for them in good time? Maybe next year we'll just all scroll into chat GPTP, is it? And there, or some other artificial intelligence uh, and just say, look, I, I'd like you to buy something for my wife that's just right and I want to hear by Christmas. And, and there'll be a knock at the door and it's all wrapped, it's all ready and dear sweetheart, I, I love you from your husband via chat GPT. <laughs> you know, hopefully that's, uh, you know, that won't happen and, and uh, you know, there's, there's something special about taking the time yourself to actually choose a gift, isn't there? But choosing the right gift can indeed be challenging and hopefully it meets the intended purpose and it's valued when it's received in the spirit that, it, that you would hope it is. As we turn to the pages of scripture this morning, we read concerning the great gift of salvation given to us by God. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, we are told again, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Our human nature is to try and work for things, to try and repay a debt, to try and somehow earn our way when we deal with many things in life, and yet when we come to the pages of Scripture, we find that God gave to us. It was God who saw that we had need, and it was the Lord who gave us the gift of his Son that he might bring the gift of salvation through his Son. The babe of Bethlehem didn't stay the babe of Bethlehem. He came to grow up as a perfect man and to give himself on Calvary. The familiar words of Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 say it so simply, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only beloved son, that whoso believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so as we come to that time of year, as we celebrate the birth of our Saviour, it, it's a wonderful time of remembrance. It is a joyous time, but for us it is also a very significant time, for we know the arrival of Christ as the child was the arrival of the Saviour of the world who came to redeem mankind. So this morning as we look at the gift of salvation, God's great gift, a gift to us, I just want to look at three aspects of God's gift of salvation. First of all, God's choice 
to give that gift, secondly, the price of the gift, and thirdly, our response to the gift. So let's just go before the Lord in prayer, and then we'll look at these areas. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the privilege that we can come. And Lord, we can offer up our worship. Lord, we know that, that the gift of salvation through Christ is the most precious thing. And uh, Lord, we handle it with care. And thank you that, Lord, you have expressed it in that way to help us understand just what you've done for us. We thank you. We look forward to what you'll teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. Firstly, God's choice to give the gift of salvation. If you read through the New Testament and other passages, you'll note that the description of salvation as a gift is not just in Ephesians, it's, it's right through the scriptures. In one way, whether it's the word gift using or the word given, there's this expression of God giving something to humanity in the form of salvation that, that we didn't deserve or we couldn't earn. In Romans 6.23, we see the word for the wages of sin is death. That's what we did deserve. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. In Hebrews chapter 6, salvation is spoken of as a heavenly gift. And in 2 Corinthians 9, Paul, in declaring the greatness of what God has done, says, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. These passages, among with many other, usually all convey a similar thought, that salvation, first of all, is from God alone. It is something from heaven given to us that, that we could not obtain for ourselves. It's an available, and available through God's son, Jesus. And secondly, it was God's choice to freely give it to us. Christianity is certainly different to all other religions or all other faiths in the sense it's not, as you've heard the saying, it's not us reaching up to God, but it is God reaching down to us. The majority of religions offer a message of self-deliverance, of, of somehow that if that God will look down on the good and the bad. And I no doubt you've had those conversations with people over time as you ask them where do they think they stand before the Lord. And, and most people, to some degree, declare their own righteousness that hopefully what they have done that is good outweighs that which is bad. And many of the religions foster people that way and that's how they survive, telling people that you can do something. Do you remember... Do you remember the, the, the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and he said, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? That's the, that's the spirit of most people. If they believe in God at all, it's what can I do? In contrast to the message of scripture is that, that there is nothing we can do. It's a message that we are dead in sin. In Ephesians chapter 2, if you go back, it says in verse 4, and having said after God is rich in mercy, in verse 5, it says, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. The Bible reminds us that our position was one of death. We were spiritually dead unto God. And I don't know about you, but one of the great sadnesses of going to a funeral is that you know that that person can do no more. They are at a state where they cannot help themselves. They are rendered helpless. And that was our condition. Spiritually, before God, we were rendered helpless or powerless to change our position. But praise God, it says here, that God who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us or made us alive together with Christ. God didn't leave us in that position. He saw that only he could re resolve it, only he could deal with it, only he could redeem us. And so we know he sent his own beloved son to come and pay the price of our sin. Do you ever think about the fact that God really owes you nothing? It's a humbling thing. I think we all like to think we have something to commend ourselves. But when, when God looked at mankind as fallen and as lost and as debased and and, and guilty in his sin, really as far as his side there was nothing of, of compelling him to have to come, to come and send his son and to go to such an extent, nothing that we deserve from God. And yet we serve a God who is truly love, who is truly compassionate, who is God, who is truly grace, and it was in this love and mercy and grace he chose to send his beloved son, his dearest, most beloved son. 
Romans 5 reminds us that he commendeth or demonstrated his love toward us in while we were yet sinners, while we were as, as really as bad as we could be, Christ died for us. And amazingly, through faith, we are told here in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6 that he has raised us up together through Christ and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that we are citizens of heaven. We have restored fellowship through faith in Christ with God himself. We have the righteousness of Christ imputed to our account. To think that we are joint heirs with Christ. What an amazing thought. Kings and priests, dearly beloved children of our heavenly Father and recipients of life everlasting. At the announcement of the birth of Jesus, there was great joy. And you recall when the shepherds were told the news of the, the arrival of the Messiah, the host of heaven just burst forth with this announcement of great joy for the things that had taken place. It was almost like heaven couldn't contain that moment any longer, for the Saviour had arrived. What a wonderful thing to think that where we have come from, God freely chose to do it and to pay that price and sacrifice for us. Then there's the price of the gift itself, the gift of Christ coming to offer salvation. How much do we value that work in and of itself? You know, gifts come in all shapes and sizes, don't they? You know, you, you go to the perhaps around a tree or whatever it is you guys do at Christmas and the handing and you put the packages all together and there are all sorts of them, the big ones to the little ones. And, uh, you know, it's interesting to watch if you've still got children or grand grandkids and you watch them all, just the different ways that they approach the gifts. And when, when the children are, are little, usually they gravitate towards the biggest ones. <laughs> and uh, you'll get the, the big ones and the child comes and they just gravitate, they go over towards the very, very biggest and they look to see if their name is on it. And then you come a little bit older, maybe the teenagers, and they're a little bit more clued in. They know that, that the biggest doesn't always represent the best or what they want. And so they're looking for the size of the package and the shape of the package. Is it, is it the thing that they've been telling mum and dad that they want? They've sort of been hitting them up and does it sort of meet the size and the shape? I must admit that I can be a little bit like that. We have a little a game in our family which has come out of the fact that I like to usually guess my gift before I actually open it. And that can be, has been a little bit frustrating for the family over the years. So this last birthday, Kelly got the present and they put it, put it in and then she wrapped it in multiple boxes and different things and did everything she could to try and confuse me so that I had no possible way and I mean she did pretty well. She got me this year. But the outward packaging doesn't always reflect the truth of what's inside. Companies go to great lengths, don't they, to try and entice us through the packaging to buy their item. And if you've ever been down to the post office and you've, you've seen those stands where you've got all these nifty little things that look so great and, you know, this trimmer that you've just got to have and nothing else compares to it on, on your beard or whatever, and then you get it and you think that's just like everything else. You know, it's not what the package led you to believe. And, you know, the reality is sometimes we can be deceived in this world. We can be drawn away by other things that seem to be something that, that they might be, but in reality they're of little value. And even as Christians, we're warned about the dangers of, of worldly things and setting our sights and, and being enticed and led away from that which is important and neglecting that which is truly of value. Even as believers, we can be familiar with hearing about what Christ has done and the gospel. To, to some extent, we do hear it every week, whether in the communion or, or through a sermon. And the writer to the Hebrews warned the believers that, that they could become dull to some extent of hearing those truths. It's so familiar that they could lose the appreciation or the value of those things and so start falling away or, or drifting from their stand in Christ. In Hebrews chapter 2, the writer warned his readers about the dangers of neglecting so great a salvation. God, be uh, far from us that we should neglect something so treasured and valuable to us. In Matthew 13, Jesus described the kingdom of heaven or being in his kingdom 
like unto a treasure hid in a field that a man stumbles across and then he hides it and then he spends everything that he has so that he can go and buy that field because he knows the value of the item and it's that precious. That is the salvation that we have been given, the gift of salvation in Christ. Tell me, have you ever had something that you've been given and you didn't realise perhaps till later the value of that item? Have you ever had that? I remember getting a gift several years ago from a, from a family relative and, and uh, initially it perhaps wasn't the one that I would have hoped for. It wasn't on my Christmas list, so to speak. And, uh, and I got it and, and, to be honest, I didn't think too much of it or use it much. And uh, then one day I was going through a shop and I saw the exact item in, boxed up and it was all there and then I saw the price. Now, please don't go out doing that. You don't look up the prices of your gifts. But I looked, I, I looked at the price and I realised that the gift was excessively more valuable than I ever thought it was. When I looked at it, it was, quite, it was considerably dearer. And so I, suddenly this whole gift took on, to be honest, a little bit different meaning. The value of the gift I understood, appreciated that the person who brought it for me not only had actually put significant thought into it, but had paid a significant price so that I could enjoy it. Now, before I was almost un, unaware, well, I was unaware, uh, and yet suddenly my eyes were open to the value and to the price that had been paid by someone who cared for me. And so it is with our salvation. We can almost have that type of thing that we're, that we're almost unaware of the degree of the price that had to be paid by our Saviour that we might be set free from sin. We kind of know it and we, we appreciate it, but we really it doesn't lay hold of us the way that perhaps it should. In 2 Corinthians 9, which you read earlier in verse 15, Paul again says, says, thanks be to God in this expression of praise for his unspeakable gift. The word unspeakable gives the impression of something that is of tremendous value, a gift so immeasurable or indescribable that we, indescribable that we couldn't fully even describe how valuable and precious it is to us. It's an, it's an object that's literally priceless. Salvation in Christ is not something we get over or move on from, or we should tire indeed of hearing. It, is, it has changed everything for us, what Christ has done. It has taken us from death to life, life from, from hell to heaven. It has opened up the door to fellowship with God, the one that created us. And it should, it should move us constantly and it should be on the tip of our tongue of praise to God constantly for what he has done. The truth is salvation is indeed a free gift. It is, it is free to us, but it was not free to Christ. There was nothing free about the cost that he paid so that you and I could be set free from sin. In John chapter 10, Christ spoke how he willing would lay his life down of his own accord. He chose to willingly lay his life down for you and my, me. A, a gift by nature is free, but it was not free to him. Charles Spurgeon said it like this, You stand before God as if you were Christ, because Christ stood before God as if he were you. He took our judgment, he took our, the penalty of our sin. He stood in our place so that we could stand, in a sense, in his righteousness before a holy God. And maybe you're here this morning and you enjoy the Christmas season and when pastor asked me to preach on this date, I thought, well, it's December. You, you always preach a Christmas message. You know, something heading that way, we're all starting to think that way. And, and maybe you're here this morning and, and, and it's a lovely time of year you think about the, the baby in the, in the manger and the singing the carols, but, uh, but who is Christ to you? Have you ever really thought about the gift that God has offered you and the price that he paid to offer it? To what extent this Christmas will that grip your heart? As mentioned earlier, it, it, it's our tendency as humans to want to work our way and to earn what we have, and yet when we come to salvation, we come up against the reality of not being able to do anything. 
of having to receive a gift of which we are so unworthy and to humble ourselves to receive it. The final point this morning is our response to the gift of God, God's great salvation. What is our response? Our response is those who perhaps don't know salvation. Our response as believers this Christmas as we, we look to celebrate and give gifts to one another. When you think about giving a gift, what usually is the response of the other person? Usually they have to make the choice to receive it. And I've, I've not personally had the experience of offering a gift and someone turning me away. But the person has to be willing to receive it, then they have to be willing to use it, and they also it's polite to also give thanks for it, isn't it? How many times have you said to your children, make sure you thank them for the gift? You know, sometimes it takes a little a bit of time to train that into, the ch into our children. As far as receiving the gift, John 1.12 says that, that Jesus, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. God extends to all humanity, to every person, his salvation. To as many as will receive the Saviour. And, and how does a person become a Christian? By turning from their sin and putting their faith in Jesus Christ, who died for them on the cross. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if we, um, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And so there is this, must be this willingness to receive it. Sadly, in the verse just before where it says to as many as received it, it says, but he came unto his own and his own received him not. How many people here but turn away? They leave that gift unwrapped and so miss out on the great gift of salvation that God has offered. There is the invitation by God, his hand extended with the gift, but have we received it? Have we taken it? Have we trusted in Christ and received the gift of salvation? Secondly, as believers, there's making use of the gift. You can have a gift and leave it on a shelf. You can, or you can take a gift and look up the instructions and get involved with it and start to value it and use it the way it was intended to be used. Praise God he has given us his word to be able to know God more, to know how he wants us to live, the way he designed us. God has given us his infallible word to teach us and instruct us to know him and to enjoy him. Do we use the gift of life and the understanding that comes from the spirit of God as saved believers teaching us through his word? He also wants us to take the gift naturally and share it, to give it out to others, to tell them of God's great gift of salvation. 2 Corinthians 4 says that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. God has placed his very precious message of salvation in breakable clay pots like you and I, earthen vessels. We are fragile by nature and yet in God's strength he can use us. He can allow us and to help us to be able to tell others of the hope that can be theirs too. Our response as God's people to the gift is to use it, to take our salvation and to spread it, but also to live for the Lord, enjoying the fellowship which Christ has obtained for us and the promises to come. And then there's the thanksgiving for the gift. Like small children receiving something so exciting, it is only appropriate that we should return thanks to our great God. I never had a, a gift of that I didn't get excited with. I don't think. I think you, the, the spontaneous thing is to thank the person or the giver for it. And how could we ever, ever give back enough thanks to God for what He's done? So this morning as we think about Christmas and, and we look forward to a time with family and others as we would give gifts, let us think about the greatest gift ever given and it was the fact that it was given to us personally, the gift of the Lord Jesus who came and gave himself for us this, uh, those 2,000 years ago. And let us think about others who, not, who don't yet have that gift so that they may receive salvation as well. Let's close in prayer. 
Heavenly Father, this morning it is a wondrous thing to contemplate what you have done, and we know that it is salvation is indeed the gift of God. It's come down from you through your Son, and, and there is none other, uh, none other under heaven whereby we must be saved. Thank you that our Saviour loved us. Thank you that he laid down his life for us and was, rose again from the dead. And thank you for the promise of everlasting life to all who will receive him. What a wonderful gift you've given us, Lord. Help us not to take it for granted, but to, but to use it in the way that you intended. Lord, to your praise and glory, we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Eighty seven. Eighty seven will be our last song. Thank you, Bryce. Isn't it true? The wonderful gift that God gives us. We just can't fathom it. And I'm so thankful that it is of grace because we never deserve it. It's, it sets you free knowing that He gives it out of His great love. Eighty seven. Let's stand as we come into it. Close in a word of prayer for us, please. Amen. Thank you all.